Namaste, Dhanavad Pranam. Uh, we are here Namaste. reading um, chapter two of Idols of the Mind versus True Reality by Bhakti, uh, Shripad Bhakti Madhava Puri Maharaj. And the title of this chapter is the same as the book. Uh, so we are excited to get started. Uh, for anyone who was watching before, um, you know, we're happy to have uh, overcome any obstacles that come for our devotional service and become fixed again uh, in whatever service we have. So thank you for bearing with us. So again, um, as we go along, uh, so, so the typical structure that we'll do is now uh, we read one week and then we'll uh, go in depth to the discussion the following week. Um, so we ask as we go along with the reading, if you just write down uh, any questions or comments that you may have. And uh, at the end of this reading, we'll also try to um, address some of them and more in depth we'll do next Sunday. <clears throat> So idols of the mind versus true reality. Reason, uncertainty, and unknowing. Dhanavat Pranam Uma Devi. Isaac Newton's goal was incomparably more vast than the discovery of the mathematical principles of natural philosophy. Newton wished to penetrate to the divine principles beyond the veil of nature and beyond the veils of human record and received revelation as well. His goal was the knowledge of God and for achieving that goal, he marshaled the evidence from every source available to him. Mathematics, experiment, observation, reason, revelation, historical record, myth, the tattered remnants of ancient wisdom. It was from the wide breadth of his learning, yet single-minded focus to comprehend true reality that led Newton to humbly remark, I do not know what I may appear to the world, but to myself, I seem to have been only like a boy playing on the seashore and diverting myself in now and then, finding a smoother pebble or a prettier shell than ordinary, whilst the great ocean of truth lay all undiscovered before me. In mathematics, the N body problem, for N is greater than two bodies interacting according to an inverse square law was well known to Newton. This played a great role in his conception of the order and stability of the solar system. The later development of chaos theory by Poincare and others recognizes this problem as well as perturbations and initial condition errors that are fundamental to computer simulated stability calculations over reiterations of billions of years. Through these methods, it has been found that ejections and collisions are possible within 5 billion years. Newton's prescient uncertainty about this led him to state, for while comets move in very eccentric orbs in all manner of positions, blind fate could never make all the planets move one in the same way in orbs concentric some inconsiderable irregularities accepted, which may have arisen from the mutual actions of comets and planets on one another, and which will be apt to increase till this system wants a reformation. This reformation or correction of the orbits had to come from somewhere. This led, to, uh, led him to integrate his alchemical vital principle and biblical wisdom with his mathematical knowledge as presented in his General Sholium in the Mathematical Principles of Natural Philosophy, published in 1687. And again, this is talking about Sir Isaac Newton. This most beautiful system of the sun, planets, and comets could only proceed from the counsel and dominion of an intelligent being. This being governs all things, not as the soul of the world, but as Lord over all. And on account of his dominion, he is wont to be called Lord God, Panto Creator, or Universal Ruler the Supreme God, is a being eternal, infinite, and absolutely perfect. So 
just to clarify now, this is Sir Isaac Newton stating that um, the eccentric orbs of planetary entities, planetary bodies, um, they are more statistically likely to uh, have collisions, but that doesn't actually happen, even though it's statistically more probable than actually occurs. So he's saying that um, there is an intelligence behind these motions. And he's describing here, this is a quote from Sir Isaac Newton's book. He's describing that he understands that uh, to be God. So this is one of the father of modern science, right? Sir Isaac Newton. And, and this is the conclusion of his intelligence that God is controlling the movements of the planets and stars. A quote attributed to Albert Einstein for whom the mystery of nature was not an alien idea, states, the human mind is not capable of grasping the universe. We are like a little child entering a huge library. The walls are covered to the ceilings with books in many different tongues. The child knows that someone must have written these books. It does not know who or how. It does not understand the languages in which they are written, but the child notes a definite plan in the arrangement of the books and mysterious order which it is uh, which it does not comprehend, but only dimly suspects. Werner Heisenberg gave us the famous uncertainty principle. It does not refer to some limitation of our knowing or measuring capacity, but to an intrinsic ambiguity in reality that cannot be overcome. This point is also made by J.B.S. Haldane. Now, my own suspicion is that the universe is not only queerer than we suppose, but queerer than we can suppose. Modern science, as we know it today, had its beginnings in the Christian West because of a faith uh, that reason or rational principles could be found in God's creation. Reason is a personal feature found in man. A world that is created by a rational being must also possess this personal feature, which we call God. It is possible that an atheistic culture would have never conceived reason in the world and therefore failed to develop science. It is the task of this article to understand how and why modern science today has turned away from and failed to comprehend this reason in the world that is similar to the noose uh, that Anaxagoras conceived as ruling the world. Explanation and correspondence. So again, so Sripad Bhakti Madhava Puri Maharaj just established uh, that the idea that God is the intelligence which is managing the affairs of the universe. And he, Sir Isaac Newton gives, you know, empirical observations which demonstrate why there must be some intelligence uh, uh, maintaining the, the cosmic manifestation. He gives empirical observations why this is the case and why he came up with this conclusion. And, and then Maharaj also gave some other quotes from uh, eminent scientists who also, um, these quotes also support this idea. So now Mahara, after establishing this, Maharaj is now getting into uh, why has modern science turned away from that? If that was historically the case, why are we not in that situation now? Why is modern science uh, atheistic essentially now? So explanation and correspondence. In the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum theory, we can indeed proceed without mentioning ourselves as individuals. Uh, but we cannot disregard the fact that natural science is formed by men. Natural science does not simply describe and explain nature. It is part of the interplay between nature and ourselves. It describes nature as exposed to our method of questioning. This was a possibility of which Descartes could not have thought, but it makes a sharp separation between the world and the eye impossible. If one follows the great difficulty which even eminent scientists like Einstein had in understanding and accepting the Copenhagen interpretation, one can trace the roots to the Cartesian partition. It will take a long time for this partition to be replaced by a really different attitude for the problem of reality. Eclipses of the sun were once predicted using the geocentric epicycles of Holodomy. They are now described in terms of the heliocentric orbits of Copernicus. Some ancients knew that they could chase away the moon dog from eating the sun god whenever they beat their gongs. 
Every time they did it, it worked. So they concluded it correlated with the truth. Each of these examples has something correct or confirming about them, even though they imagine different realities corresponding to them. As it was mentioned earlier, Newton's conception of the solar system considered God necessary to guide the alchemical vitality that was intrinsic to the order and movement in the universe. The mathematical bones of Newton's Principia Mathematica were taken by modern physics and presented as a mechanical model of the universe without the Panto Crater. Of course, Newton himself wrote his mathematical section as a whole, uh, serotipitously, including his remarks about the Panto Crater only in the appendix, uh, only in the appendix or the Scholium. However, the fact remains that observations of the solar system's movements were used to validate both Newton's and modern non-deistic theories, although they referred to very different imagined realities. So here in this quote, by Werner Heisenberg, one of the pioneers of quantum mechanics, he is saying that uh, science itself is not what nature is in itself. Science is what humans have to say about nature. Science is uh, the perspective of nature as it appears to humans. So he makes this very clear. And he goes on to say that uh, there is uh, an issue that prevents scientists from accepting that, which goes back to Rene Descartes, another father of modern science, or the father of modernism. Uh, Rene Descartes put a very uh, strong divide between matter and mind, or body and mind, such that many scientists have forgotten about the role of mind, and they're so focused on matter without the effect that mind has on matter that they think what they uh, come up with through the scientific method corresponds to nature as it is in itself and, and that their knowledge um, is unaffected by their own minds, which is coming up with this knowledge. And that's an issue. And so here Maharaj is showing that uh, there are very different descriptions of the same observed reality and he's showing these different explanations to then ask the question, um, well, uh, what is he saying here? H how is it possible, right? How is it possible that um, large amounts of people through different cultures can have a completely different description of the same experienced reality? And what this is building up to is how mind, uh, influences our perception of reality. It's what we think about reality, that's, which is different from what reality is in itself. So when we come up with these models, this is about correlation, uh, uh, correspondence, you say. Um, when we say that the model of reality, uh, that we, we have some very uh, solid idea of a model that we've created and we say that this model then correlates to reality but again that is just the figment of the imagination in this example of the, the chinese beating the gong in order to stop the solar eclipse right this is something that was believed in the past that in order to stop the solar eclipse uh, the chinese would beat a gong and the solar eclipse would end but it ended of its own accord, not because they beat the gong, but they thought it stopped because they beat the gong. So that's, that's a metaphor for what correlation is. Uh, we think we do something and then something in, uh, we think that we, we do something in our experiment and then the reaction that occurs in the experiment we take that as what is actually happening in nature. And that's called correlation, but that is not so accurate. And we'll see uh, how Maharaj explains that. A map corresponds to an actual terrain and can help one navigate one's way through the real terrain, depending on its accuracy. Yet the map may never be considered a substitute for the actual terrain, 
since a two-dimensional visual map can never represent the sensed actuality that is experienced in real terrain. A reflection of reality in a mirror may accurately depict the objects being reflected, but one who makes a journey through the looking glass will not discover the real world, but a wonderland of exaggerated imaginations like Lewis Carroll's Alice did. Atomic theory and quantum theory provide imagined wonderlands that possess some observations or correspondence with true reality to some degree. Each is logical, self-consistent, and complete, although Godel would object to either being at the same time consistent and complete. If we carefully consider what science is doing here, we discover that anthropocentric or egocentric conceptions of reality, reality as it is for us or for me, are being erected in place of true reality as it is by itself and for itself, as described by Hegel. In other words, a subjective conception or theory that is for us is being erected as reality in and for itself, although it is opposed to objective reality as it is in and for itself. It seeks and may have some correspondence with true reality, and if the subjective conception corresponds with the objective reality, the truth is considered to have been reached. This is called the correspondence theory of truth. However, there are problems with this, as we have noted above, in that different theories may have some correspondence with objective observations and yet still refer to different imagined realities. The real problem arises when these different idols of the mind man-made images, ideas, or conceptions that are for us in our subjectivity are presumed to be outwardly objective and venerated as the true reality, reality as it is or by itself and for itself. Explanations consist of descriptions in terms of the chosen theories assumed as real, even though they are abstractions from the true reality. Since they are abstractions, they never comprehend the concrete reality that they merely represent. Since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that men are without excuse. This was a quote from Romans 120. So measurable properties are observations of the true reality that we perceive and incorporate into the realm of our subjectively constructed theory, ideas, or idols, which we think allow us to explain the original objects of true reality. Of course, scientific measurement only involves the quantitative superficial outer husk of things. Thus, it cannot give us a genuine explanation of the essence that courses, for instance, through a blade of grass, producing and making it what it is. Such idols cannot comprehend the invisible qualities of the living teleological process at work in the formation of inexplicably complex molecular structures that their models are unable to reconcile. Of course, lacking any semblance of life or consciousness, such mechanical or dynamical models of strictly impersonal and therefore incompatible with any sort of reason uh, in the world or personality. The quote from Romans above admonishes that there is no excuse for such naivety. It is a failure of scientists to understand what they are doing and how to properly approach true reality. Fred Hoyle has remarked, there is a coherent plan to the universe, though I don't know what it's a plan for. Sir Francis Bacon, one of the earliest fathers of science, warned about creating idols and what should be avoided. Idols of the tribe, innate to finite man. So now these four are from Sir Francis Bacon, who is another father of modern science. Idols of the tribe, innate to finite man. Deceptions of the subjective mind and imperfect senses are intrinsic to us. Mere imaginations gain the dignity of reality and are mixed with facts so that they become, uh, become inseparable. Idols are molded from these compounds. Idols of the cave, the well of the individual mind. An individual who is dedicated to some particular branch of learning interprets everything according to the colors of his own narrow field and experience. If the only tool you have is a hammer, you treat everything as a nail. Idols of the marketplace, 
semantics or words. Words make private thoughts public. But when bombastic words are substituted for thoughts, one believes he can convince his opponents by out-talking them. This arises from pure vanity that drags the dignity of philosophy and science into the mud. And finally, idols of the theater, sophistry. Putting on a show, arguing in terms of popular familiarities that are false. What is obvious or familiar has not been carefully thought through. Thus, what is familiar is not on that account necessarily known. So here, Maharaj uh, has basically explained that modern science has taken the mathematical bones of Newton, forgetting any talk about the, ne the necessity of God. They've just taken the bones, the bare bones of that. And that is uh, the mechanical metaphor. So now instead of seeing the teleological purpose, which is controlling things, which is direct, not controlling, uh, but which is the goal directed activity of um, things in nature natural ph phenomena, just the mechanical, mathematical aspect of that was taken from, from Newton's uh, work. And it was presented as the mechanical metaphor, which is now so prevalent. So living entities are called uh, as mechanical systems. We discussed that last chapter. They, they don't recognize the difference between biological systems and mechanical systems. Everything is just a mechanical system with different degrees of complexity. So Maharaj is saying that that idea, uh, that is uh, an idol of the mind. And the way that scientists uh, then go about trying to support that idol of the mind, we have this division, right? Idols of the tribe, um, where some, some parts of the living activity of biological systems uh, is recognized, but it's explained in terms of correspondence or correlation. What we said before, how that's not a proper way to uh, go about properly explaining uh, what reality is because it can relate to reality to some degree, but then there's a huge gap which is not addressed, and that is just accepted as okay, which leads to people accepting things like biological systems are just machines. So that uh, the, the inappropriate use of correlation is one of the idols, is one of the uh, parts of the foundation for this kind of idol of the mind. So idols of the cave, now we have a very limited sense, uh, everyone that wants to study things through a materialistic lens from the, from the start, and then they're producing materialistic explanations of reality, but they've already adopted the materialistic ideology from the beginning. So they're gonna see things from that point of view. Like we said before with Werner Heisenberg, science is what we say about nature, not what nature is in itself. So whatever we're assuming from the start, that will then reflect into what we see in nature. So this is the idols of the cave. We're only seeing things uh, from the opening of the cave, which we're inside. We're inside a little cave, we're boxed in, and then we see reality in the shape of the opening of the cave. But that's not a full perspective of reality. Idols of the marketplace. When, when you're in the marketplace, you try to make things sound very good so people buy them, even if they're not very good, right? So this is you know, how... Uh, <laughs> The, the fancy words that nobody understands except for the scientists themselves and the complex theories that you need to go through 10 years of school to properly understand. And if you haven't done that, then you should just believe it. You know, that's idols of the marketplace. And then idols of the theater, talking about popular familiar familiarities. 
trying to relate to people based on where they are in a familiar sense to make them feel comfortable with an idea. Although that position which they are at in that comfort is not itself based on any kind of reasoned thought. It's just based on, uh, you know, mm. uh, some kind of immediate enjoyment and it hasn't really been thought out. Is this a proper position to maintain? So when ideas are then brought to that level and try to uh, appeal to that kind of thinking, then it becomes a mess. So this is trying to explain how such ideas, like the biological system is the mechanical system, how such ideas have become embraced uh, as they are today. So God, the universal I, is also self-consciousness and not merely consciousness. So self-consciousness and consciousness, the difference here. Thought is only true in proportion as it sinks itself in the facts and in the point of form, it is no private act of the subject. Hegel. Descartes, cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am, has come to signify the slogan for modernity. I think puts all the important power of thinking in the I. Not only that, it also establishes the absolute being of the I. However, if we try to determine how it is that we perform this amazing activity of thinking, we draw a blank. If I don't know how to do it, then the certainty that I do it should at least seem dubitable. Hegel looks at the problem more realistically. Withdrawing from reality to be with one's subjective thought alone is a detachment from the substantial content of true reality and becomes a conceit or superiority to it. This type of freedom from the content must be given up. And instead of arbitrarily directing the content of one's thought, one's freedom should be sunk into and pervade the content of reality, letting thought be directed and controlled by reality's own proper nature of which our essential selves are but a part and manifestation. We do not lose anything thereby except our false sense of self, our false ego. And rather we gain our true identity and real concrete freedom. Free agency does not reside in us as separated from reality, but within true reality itself in which we participate. Reason is in the world universal rationality that is also intrinsically particular to us individually and to all. By abstractly considering the self as separated from reality and superior to it, we depart from that universal reason, which is the basis for all rational men to come in accord. A verse from the Bible, come now and let us reason together, Isaiah 118. Religion teaches all to surrender to God, the supreme reality, from whom reason and wisdom originate. Wisdom is not a property of the universe, although we find life and intelligence in nature. It is a quality of a person, the divine personality of Godhead. Just as consciousness and intelligence pervade our body's activities, so God's personal energy pervades and forms the whole reality with life and intelligence. Not only does religion teach surrender of our false egos to the true reality of God, but also teaches us how to learn the truth by attending to the revelation, uh, to the revelation of it, rather than encouraging the tendency to impose and project one's self-imaginings onto reality. Taking oneself as a separate subjective agent against the passive objectivity that lacks its own agency and ability to reveal itself. Reality as possessing personal agency can reveal God's self to us if we adopt the attentive patience that allows the veils of self-centered egotism to dissolve by the practice of meditation, surrender, and service. Reality as by itself and for itself means that the absolute is its own origin, cause of itself or cause of sui, and has its own purposes for itself. Thus, reality cannot be impersonal. To judge good and bad by our self-centered perspectives 
will not bring us closer to truth, but entangle us further in the misconception of separate interest. This is something each individual has to understand for themselves. To try to force another to this conclusion is itself something that can only arise from misconception and lead one further into delusion. Experience is the uniting mediator between subject and object, which are the basic aspects of consciousness. Hegel calls the following of the experience of consciousness phenomenology. This leads to the development of true science or science of the true. This is not easy for the abstract analytical modern scientist to comprehend, yet Hegel's phenomenology of spirit is there for guiding the study of this method. To study the whole as a whole and not merely in its parts requires an immersion into that which forms and informs us. The part cannot be understood apart from its unity with the whole. Here we have to deal with the logic of the unity and difference of part and whole. It is not an impersonal abstract unity or oneness that is intended. God is not one with nature as in pantheism. God is transcendental to nature as much as imminent within it. The soul is transcendental to the body, yet imminent in it, as we can observe when the body dies. The soul or life leaves the body behind. The soul is not the body, yet at the same time, it expresses itself in and through the body. The same soul remains transcendental to the body through all its changes from childhood to youth to old age. In the same sense, God is the transcendental, a God is transcendental to the ever-changing restlessness of the universe, while remaining the integral universal mind or spirit of which the living entities are particular determinate beings. Some people only acknowledge universal consciousness and thus end in an impersonal unity as the highest truth. However, this does not properly comprehend the individual I and universal we. This is because for the individual finite uh, empirical consciousness and the universal consciousness, there exists a true unity and possibility of self-consciousness. The necessity of self-consciousness in every consciousness is explained by Kant in his critique of pure reason. So let me just try to summarize some of this. So from here at the beginning, Maharaj is bringing attention to the idea that, again, the general theme of what this chapter is trying to bring attention to is the relation between thinking and the things that are thought about. What is the effect that mind has on uh, the objects that we observe through the mind, that we think about? What is the relationship between the two? So modern science largely assumes that there is an objective nature which is completely separate and outside of us, the observers or the scientists. Nature is completely separate and outside of us. And now we are coming to that and observing that as if our observation does not in any way affect that external nature. So it's a very subtle point, but it's very important because this assumption that we are uh, distinct from nature and we don't have any effect on nature or our subjectivity does not have any effect on how we perceive nature. That is all purely a presumption. And that is nothing that has been proved by any kind of uh, experimental, empirical experimental procedure. That is purely an assumption. And it's largely made unconsciously because of this whole uh, development of modern thinking since Descartes made that separation between mind and matter that was described before. So keeping that in mind, now uh, Maharaj is presenting that Hegel presents it much more realistically that how is it possible that we, our own thinking doesn't have any effect on what is thought about? 
how is it so so how does then how does our thinking affect what we see that would be the next point right and hegel's philosophy describes that and so maharaj is just introducing us to this slowly he explaining that we're not separate from reality right we are a part of it we are from the conception of nature, um, we are a part of nature. And every part of nature is interdependent on the other parts. Nothing is isolated and separate. We may think about it like that, but that's completely our own thinking. That's not how it actually is. Or we completely depend on nature for every uh, thing about our physical existence. So to, to have some idea that our interact, our observation of nature or our own uh, scientific approach doesn't affect how we perceive that is very naive. That's why science is called naive realism. So Maharaj is trying to show the necessity for thinking about thought itself. And he's now bringing some attention to the reason in the world. So how is it possible that our thought can come to know the world that seems to be external from us, although it's also related to us? It's because reason is there in the world. It's, it's a part of uh, how nature is working. And that reason is perceptible to us because it's also in us. Reason is all pervasive. And then Maharaj shows that what is that reason in a universal sense? Like Isaac Newton uh, also concluded, well, in a universal sense, that reason is God. But it's, we are individual moments of that universal activity. We are participating in that but on an individual level. We're not the universal, we're on an individual level. So from our individual perspective, we have consciousness, but there's something more than that. And Hegel's systematic development of philosophy shows how to come to know that and how we are a part of that. And again, Maharaj is trying to introduce us to that in a very thoughtful, careful way. So consciousness itself, right? A lot of modern ideas about consciousness are all over the place. But Maharaj is presenting what Hegel has presented, and it's very clear, actually, about what consciousness is. There is a subject and there is an object. The subject is who is observing an object. An object is what is external from the subject. So there's, that's two things. But now there is a relationship where the subject can take the object into itself and think about it. That's consciousness. So you have the subject, the observer, the object, the observed, and then the process of observ observing. And that's what consciousness is. It's the subject-object relation. And it's a very clear way to approach this. And the development of how that subject-object relation unfolds, how the subject comes to know the object from a very immediate way, where it thinks the object is completely separate from itself, and then it comes to know the intimate relationship between the subject and object, that development is the phenomenology of spirit, which uh, elaborates on the different forms of consciousness, which are the different uh, stages of the subject-object relationship, but they take on very different determinate forms, and, and that's what the phenomenology shows. So we'll just continue now. He's gonna talk about consciousness and self-consciousness. In order for consciousness to be conscious of an object, it must be capable of self-consciousness. Calling oneself I, the ego, refers to this self-consciousness. 
It is this concept of self-consciousness that Kant called the transcendental unity of apperception that provides the possibility for consciousness of an object or the unity of the two. Possibility, concept, and actuality, content, are always correlated in this way. So one cannot talk about possibility abstractly as if it meant anything were possible without reference to its actuality. Aristotle is famous for stating that the actual is needed for the conception of the possible. So this is a very important idea, this transcendental unity of apperception by Kant. Kant realized that when the subject is observing an object, it's only what it's actually perceiving with the senses is, is multiplicity, right? We, we call a thing a sugar cube, but what is the actual sensuous experience of that? What we're, what we're experiencing is squareness or cubeness, whiteness, graininess, sweetness. We're experiencing this manifold of qualities which are all different from each other, but we're calling it one thing, sugar cube. So Kant asked or uh, made us aware of how is it that when we're experiencing just a, a manifold of different things, completely different from each other, that we're calling it as one object, one unity. And that is the I, the I, the, the subject is coming and perceives the manifold as a unity. Although it's just all different, it's all different qualities. It's completely different qualities, but we're perceiving it as we're calling it a unity. It's a sugar cube, it's one thing. And that one thing is differentiated, has so many different qualities, but it's, it's a unity in difference. It, so that's, this is the development of that. We shouldn't just think that it's, uh, naively just some thing, one thing, it's, it's, a, it's differentiated, it has content. But that content is the content of, of a concept, which is a unity of differentiated things. And it's a very basic idea here, we're talking about a sugar cube, but, but the application of this on a bigger scale is very profound. It's, it's what the concept is. The concept is the unity of the differentiated content of anything, this applies to anything, whether it's a sugar cube or a human being or the world. Uh, but when we talk about a sugar cube, it's much easier to just deal with. And it's, it's, it's a subtle distinction, but if we can accept, or if we can see for ourselves, we can actually see this, that when we perceive things in nature, we're just seeing different, we're seeing differentiation. Anything we observe in nature, a tree, we're seeing brownness and greenness and, and the fluffiness of the leaves on top and the rigidness of the bark. We're seeing completely different sense perceptions, but we know it as one thing. We know it as a tree. So that's something that the mind is doing. The mind is unifying. It, the senses itself, the sense experience is a completely differentiated thing, but the mind is coming and is, is recognizing that it's a unity. And so that's a very important function that the mind is playing in relationship to matter that is being perceived with the senses. And Kant came to highlight that and show the importance that yes, the mind is playing a role, a very important role in, in our observations of nature. It's the mind, what, what, in Kant's case, he's calling the mind, it's the mind that is unifying these things. It's the role of the mental faculty. I have a question. Yes. So you mentioned the sugar cube and mm -hmm. and its uh, qualities and and what it what it has. Um, it changes when something else is brought in, like hot water. Mm -hmm. That completely changes its um, what it looks like, and it disappears because the water is hot and it melts it. And so I don't know how that would relate or how that would where that comes in, where it's not just what it appears to be at first sight, but when it interacts with something else, it completely changes its qualities. 
Um, I don't know if you can make a correlation of when that happens. Yeah, right. so I mean, uh, the unity of apperception is is just making the point that the mind is unifying uh, any any differentiated content we see in nature as a single thing. So the same thing with water. You're seeing reflect. You're seeing reflectivity. You're seeing fluidity. You're seeing clearness. So these are all. So so it's the mind that comes and knows. Oh, this is a water. This is a unified thing. Water. So that idea of the function of the mind is is just to highlight this specific function. What you're explaining though is just how um, the, the the relationship between these two things, the, the relationship between these two objects, that they have a relation with each other. And that's just a chemical system from last chapter, right? It's, it's like you're saying, when two things come in contact with each other and they had the distinct identity before they came in contact and when they come in contact now, they have a new identity. Right, that's a that's a chemical system, so that's just that, that's more about the relationship they have with each other. Um, and still, it, it requires the capacity of the mind to see the unity. What is the relationship? Means a, it's a unity and difference. You have two different things that have a relationship with each other, so, so it's a unity. The relationship means a union. They have some relation, a union of two or more than one different thing. So still the mind has to come and perceive that unity as a relationship and then further determine the details of that relationship and why it's significant. Is that okay? Yeah, good. Thank you. Dr. Sahu, did you have? Yeah. Yes. Uh, can I ask one question? Please. Am I audible? Yes, you are. <clears throat> yes. Uh, the problem is that it's a very good paper. Like uh, I can see... Uh, that it has covered many aspects to understand the God, one hand, and the role of the functioning of the mind on the other hand. You started with Newton's explanation and Einstein. Uh, all these are important, and also you discussed about the Cartesian problem, and uh, so, and also discussed the how Hegelian model is a better than. Uh, Cartesian model. My only problem is in understanding is that once you allow the reason to be uh, higher than the faith, okay, so then anything can be happened. So whether it is a rationalistic model of uh, Hegel or it is a Cartesian model, the problem will not be resolved. So uh, we have the limitations of mind. And uh, uh, that limitations will be there, whether it is a rationalistic model or it is a materialistic model or it is an idealistic or realistic model. So that how do you address the uh, problem of the mind? Second thing is that since we all are, like there are many things you have used that uh, when you give big, big words, or try to justify certain things in certain ways. So you have to take it for granted that people are basically live with the desire. And basically they are either good or bad. So because uh, that is a So who has created, if the God is there, why God has created the evil? That is, then if the evil has been created by the God, then why can't we accept uh, rationally uh, new, what Newton is saying is right and what others are saying is right? So like uh, basically we all are human beings. We have limitations. And through refining our karma, there might be a possibility that we can risk to the level of transcendent, transcendental level, uh, either through the unity of transcendental unity, as you mentioned in the Kantian framework. But my problem is that, uh, would you suggest that it, it is that only that uh, religion can uh, provide you the directions or some other way, or uh, like, uh, I don't understand that what we are basically uh, looking for by uh, do God wants us to leave everything 
uh, in the materialistic world and to go to the him or uh, do god wants us to be here and to do the good karmas that's the like uh, i i i i just uh, completely uh, uh, not able to accept that if we give reason as a chance like you said that hegel so hegel that his problem was there because history was there and then the desire was there and desire when we talk about hegel also talk about the biological desire and talks uh, speaks about the human desire and uh, there is also when you talk about biological desire and human desire he speaks about animal desire also then uh, what kind of desire we are talking here like so if we accept hegel as a realistic model or better than cartesian model that uh, i do not find a self complete picture also there there also i find a human limitations of the mind functioning and going through a thesis antithesis and to the state of becoming is also there then how do you respond to that theory so your first point which you also concluded with was about the limits of the of the mind so what maharaj was presenting was when we start with the idea that descartes had that uh, i think you you thinking thought comes from myself so the limitation comes from thinking that we are the source of this activity instead of realizing that this activity is there in experience and we're able to participate in that it's the way that we're thinking of our own daily experience the the tendency to always have this self-centered reaction where we think things belong to us and are coming from us that is what leads to the misconception thought is not coming from us right otherwise like maharaj explained right in this chapter if, if you can't explain how you're doing something then it's it's very much questionable if you are the one doing it so if i am thinking or or you are thinking then, then we have to explain how how are we doing that right we know that we're thinking for as long as we remember we've been thinking one thing or another thing but how right when did we start <laughs> and how and how did we do that we can't answer that we were just we were born like that and and anyone we speak to if they're sober right they were also just born with the capacity to think they don't know how it's going on right even when we're asleep we go to sleep and we're still dreaming still thinking is going on even though we're completely unconscious for the most part so so this activity that is going on intimately in our experience uh is happening it's coming from something that is beyond our ourself and when we can start to think like that start to see that thought and reason are beyond us but permeating everything that we're doing because then we have the capacity to engage with thought we have the capacity to to see nature and to know something about nature or we cannot we can know something about nature but again the idea that uh, that is coming from our individual self then completely abstracts what is going on we get an abstraction and and when we cling to those kind of abstractions where we are in the center that that is essentially the root of evil what is called evil the root of evil is that you think it's about yeah and i'm not saying you i'm saying any anyone myself included when you think you are the center that is the root of evil right no one no singular individual is the center right the absolute is the center the infinite is the center right? and so when we can understand god in, in those kind of more reasonable terms the infinite the unlimited the absolute from which all other finite things or relative things are coming as a part of that absolute 
that absolute is the center, then we're starting to have a more realistic idea of what is going on. And uh, uh, at least from thought, where, where is thought coming from? Where is reason coming from? It's, it's an activity occurring throughout the infinite. It's, it's a part of the infinite itself. It's a part of then God. It's an activity of God. And we are participating in that. And when we can then uh, adjust our approach to knowledge, keeping that central, then we can have some idea of the whole, right? We're not thinking apart, isolated part, isolated part. And then we can just imagine what all the parts look like together, like we're building a Lego house or something, right? That's not how to approach the truth. The whole is there from the, from the beginning. We are a part of the whole. These activities are occurring throughout the whole, which we have access to. And knowledge means to understand that dynamic organic relationship in its details. Of course, we want to know the details. That's fine. But we have to start with this, with the proper uh, premise. Not that it's coming from a finite. It's coming from the infinite in the context. It's coming from a, the, the widest possible context. Everything is coming from this wider context. So the limits of our mind are that we think that it's coming from us. When we accept that as a finite individual, we are part of the infinite then we can overcome that finitude because any part of the infinite must also be infinite to some degree. This is where the word infinitesimal comes in. Infinite is there, but infinitely small, like counting, right? You can count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and you can keep going infinitely. That's one kind of infinity, but another kind of infinity is where you can't even begin. Should you begin from 0.1 or 0 0.008 or negative 1.532? You don't even know where to start. From, from that bigger infinite, or you can do a smaller infinite, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, keep going. So the small infinite and big infinite. So we're a small infinite. We're a part of the infinite. We're a part of the big infinite. And so then there are different approaches to knowledge once we can embrace that. One approach, now this is good, getting to your question about religion. Can, does only religion give the proper way? The, the epistemological approach of religion is descending knowledge, right? Revelation, that the infinite, the big infinite is revealing itself to the small infinite. Because that is the only way that the small infinite can come to know the big infinite. Otherwise, how can the, how can the small thing, how can the finite come to know the infinite of its own finite power? It, it can't. It can realize that it's a part of something bigger than itself and then hope and strive to come to know that by the activity of that which is greater than itself. And that's what revelation is. So the practical application of, of revelation then is not to uh, renounce our material, uh, is, is to renounce our material experience our material interaction. But all that means is that we are renouncing our own so activity. What it means is that we are giving up this frustration effort, this frustrating effort of trying to do everything thinking we are in the center and that it's supposed to be for us, period. And we're trying to put that center properly back uh, on the absolute. Everything is for the absolute. By and for, everything is for the absolute, including ourselves, including our experience. And so when we adopt that kind of thought, and then we start interacting with people with that idea, we start listening to certain people with that idea and not listening to other people based on that idea, all with the underlying reason that we are trying to... Uh, reinstate our natural position as a participant of that infinite whole. Right? That is the reason that we now will adjust our interactions with the world. We make different decisions now. Now, instead of, like we said, instead of trying to uh, 
make decisions based on, it makes us feel good in a finite, immediate sense versus, you know, maybe I need to take some slight austerity, but it will actually end up being for my uh, ultimate good and it will give more fulfillment to me, right? In the process of bhakti, there is some, there is some uh, giving up of the material things in the beginning, but ultimately this is uh, the way to have the satisfaction of uh, being situated in the constitutional position of always remembering that we are a finite part of the infinite. Anytime that we then try to go back to the idea that no, we are the center and we will do whatever is necessary for us to enjoy to the most by ourselves and thinking ourselves very strong and very and very independent. And we can do anything by ourselves. Thinking like that will only will only make things very difficult for ourselves. Um, so this is the limits of mind, right? We are we are finite. If we can recognize that, then that is part of the progress of overcoming that finitude. What is evil? Why is there evil in the world? Evil is there because we can choose to be our, the center of our own reality, but then we'll experience illusion. That's that's what evil is. We can choose ourselves. We have that freedom, but then we'll have to experience the illusory reality that comes with that because that's not the true thing. We are not the center, we are not the whole. We are not think, we are not the source of thought, we are not the source of reality. We're just a part of reality. We're a part of thinking, we're participating in that. So, and does only religion give the way? Traditionally in, in the world, religion is emphasizing this idea of revelation, but there is a way to come to know that through a reason not blind faith, but faith that sees, right? Through reason and thoughtful uh, development of applying things and, and, and hearing from others in a, in a proper and a humble and a receptive mood, being patient, not trying to control the outcome of actions, taking it. So, so we have to find the, the happy, the medium for us what how we can apply these things in a in a nice way and how we can listen and how we can adjust our life slowly whatever pace we need to take that is there but religion is just giving uh, a method of descending knowledge and showing the necessity of that because only the infinite can reveal itself to the finite the finite can't know the infinite by its own power that's a very simple rational principle but then the the actuality of that as it is expressed in the process of bhakti yoga, through association with the devotees, through accepting what is favorable to the devotional service and, and rejecting what is not favorable to devotional service. These are all the practical methods of, of coming to become further situated, more firmly, more fixed in that, uh, in that realization that we should just try to be uh, an active, participant in the infinite because that is our constitutional position and give up all these efforts of trying to be the center ourself and and I mean, this is i don't know if i've gotten off topic um, <laughs> i think this is all i can say <laughs> Rabuji, i agree with you completely thank you so much but my problem is uh, what you are saying is right but uh, only my concern is you begin with a science as limitation, mind as limitations. But again, justifying uh, something on the basis of the rationalistic model or universalistic model, again, will lead back to a kind of accepting science as uh, has the power. So my concern is only that only. Because what you said, I agree with you completely. But the pedagogy, or the, like if we begin with that, Newton's SARS limitations and the way the scientists explain the things. But again, coming back to a kind of model and uh, saying that this can be a kind of alternative uh, path to the religion or 
surrendering God, Hegelian model, or any model, then we can again, we are bringing the contradiction into that. If we say that reason, whether it is a subjective form or it is, it is an objective form, that uh, because if you see Vedantic model is also highly successful, whether it is Bhakti Vedant or any Vedant, uh, there is an experiential model. We start from the subjectivism. Again, we go back to objectivism. That is that Aham Brahma Asmi concept. Then we go to Sarvam Kalu Idam Brahma. The whole universe is that. So then we bring the universal element into that. So if that is the thing we are looking for, then we are trying to prove everything on the basis of either science or any kind of method. So then we are not giving the God uh, the enough space to guide us or God has created everything. We are making the position of God very limited. Are so, you getting my point? So anytime that we're thinking we are making, we're still an illusion. Anytime that we're thinking that our thought is dictating what reality is, we're an illusion. That reality no, my is thought is created by God. My thought, whatever, like there is a God, if it is, uh, is within me, so that has been created by God only. Why do I need any kind of reason for that? Why do I need any kind of science for that? Why do I need any kind of mind for that? I Hegel's, whole approach, it, Hegel's whole approach is not that it is an I thinking of some model. Hegel's approach is the absolute is unfolding itself. Spirit is coming to know itself through necessity, not through these contingencies. I think this, I think that, I can do whatever I want and put it together and have a smile on my face. Hegel's philosophy is you are, you are, uh, ex you are witnessing the necessary development stage by stage category by category of the absolute starting from logic what are the underlying logical principles that are true for all pure thought and then sensuous thought in nature what are that's this is something Kant started right that Hegel built upon there are there are uh, underneath our subjective experience as an I underneath our experience of nature, of things, there are thoughts, there are categories that are automatically a part of anything that we say. This is showing the rational structure of reality, which is beyond I or that outside of the I. So the whole point is we are not thinking in terms of models. We can construct models based on our finite perspective and then compare them based on our egoic perspective. That will get us nowhere. The, the, the approach is to how we can bring our thinking, finite thinking, in accord with what is actually there in the environment. So the whole approach is trying to come in accordance with that. So what Kant was realizing is that, oh, I, this, this unity is happening of its own accord, this unity of our perception. I'm experiencing this manifold of things, but then somehow it became one, one object. I'm calling it as one object. There are these categories that are being applied to what is being observed that I'm automatically doing without even realizing. These are happening beyond what I thought I was doing. And now I've just realized that I can recognize it because it's, it's a rational structure of reality. I can recognize it. But I'm not creating. I'm not creating that. These are things that are underlying our sensuous experience, our own th thought processes. So when we can come to realize those things that are there, right? It's a very, it's a very subtle, thoughtful process. We can't assert our own egoic things. We, you know, this or that. It's, it's a very subtle mediation. Right? Kant was a very uh, unique individual the way he left his, his lived, lived his life if you read about him he was a very meditative individual he was not trying to assert his own egoic things he was trying to just passively uh experience what he was in he was trying to experience that right and so then he could recognize these categories and uh, and then hegel was able to see even deeper into that 
what is the, the necessary step-by-step -step development of these categories through logical determinations, through nature, into spirit, how the absolute is moving in this way of its own accord, and we are in a part of that. But the whole thing is completely non-egoic. Not, I think this model, I think that model, let's compare the models, and whoever can come up with a more robust explanation or whoever gives up first is the loser and I'm the one. Th these things which are going on in the name of so-called science and academic, this is all just egoic nonsense and you have fun with that, but the next lifetime you'll become a squirrel, okay? Good luck. <laughs> but anyway, that's maybe not so good to say. Thank you so but much, thank you. That's thank it, you. I, I got it. <laughs> thank you so much. Yes. Um, so, there's still a little bit left in the chapter, but I think David Hutididi was trying to say something before. <laughs> You're on mute, Didi. We couldn't hear. I was just asking, uh, wanted to ask examples for unity of a perception, mm. which you were talking uh, after you people spoke. I think I got my slide. Okay, sorry. Um, is it okay if we try to finish the chapter? Uh, okay. Okay. okay, so the totality of finite eyes or we also has its universal essence, i.e. since every I calls itself an I, there must be a universal I. Thus God, the universal I, is also self-consciousness and not merely consciousness free will and the fall. If men were born free, they would, so long as they remained free, form no conception of good and evil. Proof. I call free him who is led solely by reason. He, therefore, who is born free and who remains free has only adequate ideas. Therefore, he has no conception of evil or consequently good and evil being correlative of good. This is from Spinoza. By remaining united with the universal reason of divine reality or God, the duality of good and evil does not arise. Only when man withdraws from universal reason into the particular individuality of subjective understanding, eating from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, is he thrown from the Garden of Eden of the unity with God by disobeying his commands, departing from the universal reason? A truly free individual knows that everything is all right because of one's unity with the divine reason that rules the world. This freedom from the duality of good and evil and of life and the fear of death is possible for one whose particular will is dovetailed with the universal. One is free to reject universal reason and live according to one's own separate egotistic reason and will, but this is the cause of irrationality and evil in the world. The labor that man and woman are punished to endure is actually a blessing. For by such work or labor in the world, as much as labor to properly learn about true reality, they come to release themselves from self-centered subjectivity and unite with the universal objective reality that they abandoned due to choosing to cultivate false self-centered understanding withdrawn from universal divine reason or God, I and mine. The truth is the whole. The whole, however, is merely the essential nature reaching its completeness through the process of its own development. The truth is the whole. The part is an abstraction or untruth if it is taken in its isolated identity. It is not what it analytically appears to be. It has its identity only in its integral relation to the whole. To grasp the part from the perspective of the whole, a new method is needed distinct from understanding the whole as constituted, constructed from its parts. The whole has its finite parts. It is not that the uh, part finite ego ever vanishes as some Buddhists and nihilists think or merges into the whole and becomes the whole as abstract monism. The whole always contains its parts. They are not separated in isolated identity. That is their false identity. Rather, they are understood in rational integrity with the whole. 
This relation in its highest sense is called love, where there is a lover and a beloved on both sides. Since the part has its true identity as a part of the whole, there is a natural affinity of the part for the whole in its highest or most perfect or satisfying form. This affinity is called love. This can be experienced most fully in the human form, although every partial being as a part of the whole feels this affinity. The false eye is the sense of identity as a part of the whole separated, unrelated to, or withdrawn from the whole. There is no such separate identity or false ego in reality. This false ego is merely brought about by an abstract conception of I and mind. The feeling of having a mind of its own or owning anything arises from this sense of mind. The I is even more troublesome because it thinks I am, and thus considering itself the whole of being, thinks I am God. It thinks in terms of its separated self as I am a human being, American, white, etc. But no man is an island unto himself. All are a piece of the whole. This is a, a poem from John Donne, actually. No man is an island entire of itself. Every man is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. It is false because the true identity of the part is in dialectical unity with the whole. In religious terms, as a servant of God. By forgetting or ignoring this unity, one's true self or identity is lost. The problem then arises that one thinks he loses his abstract freedom by submission to God, when in fact he gains it concretely for the first time. That's why it is called mukti or moksha, liberation or freedom, or salvation in religion. Freedom requires necessity for it to exist in any concrete sense. If one travels a road, without observing rules or laws, chaos, caprice, and destruction would result, not freedom to go where one wants. Such freedom without necessity would be abstract and not real. The concept of matter or materialism arises when the environment experienced as separate from the divine spirit or God is imagined as having its own separate real being. This creates the imaginary field of separated energy and existence. In the exterior material world, everything is considered external to everything else and separate from everything. Everything possesses abstract identity or a false identity only. In other words, each entity is assumed to be what it is not and is not what it is assumed to be. Aristotle gave the example that a hand detached from the body is not a hand since it does not serve the function of a hand, which is what we mean by hand. The whole from which the false self withdraws now appears as a transcendental truth for such a person. The soul is one's real identity within the whole. The identity remains undeveloped or dormant because one is developing a purely separated material life and neglecting their spiritual life. The material body is thus an illusion of a separate being that has its real spiritual existence as a part and parcel of the whole or God. When comprehended in true unity with the whole, one's spiritual nature is revealed, although the material misconception initially covers it. Because the parts of a machine are brought together by an agent or agency outside and apart from the parts themselves, the parts do not of their own accord form themselves into a machine. The parts or members of an organism, however, uh, have their agency within them as the soul, which has its identity only in relation to the divine whole. The analytical understanding cannot deal with the integral wholes and therefore cannot understand the soul or God. The material body is illusory in the sense that it cannot be understood in its true identity without knowing its relationship to the whole. Analyzing its composition in terms of separated molecules or neurons is also illusory. Understanding how to go from an untrue or partially true part to its truth within the whole requires a method developed by Hegel called conceptual thinking. Reproduction is not merely concerned with individuals, it involves the genus or genus process. The universal genus that determines the species is not changed when particulars under the universal change, die, or reproduce according to their own kind of species. Without connecting the individual organisms with their species, we may wrongly think they may evolve into any species by chance, but this is not how individuals and species are related to each other. The species determines how the individuals will appear and control their reproduction, growth, and so on. 
they are not independent to become whatever they want by choice or by chance. The relation between universal and particular is ignored by evolutionists. Therefore, they cannot develop a proper theory on a purely abstract material basis. Everyone calls themselves I, so I is universal, although each person means only oneself. In the same way, each organism is identified with its species, although we speak, uh, when we speak, we refer to the particular organism. For example, a dog cannot, a dog and not canine in general. We speak of a dog and not a canine in general. Thus, the universal and particular cannot be separated from each other. Similarly, individuals who identify with only personal reason, independent of universal reason, are misconceiving true reason. Although universal and particular are related, they are not the same, but a unity in difference. The universal by itself is abstract as a particular by itself. At the same time, their relation can only be comprehended within a higher unity, the higher self or supreme individual. And here is just a, a little uh, picture of essentially the shift in consciousness from egocentric false ego to theocentric true reality, that we're just the part and the absolute is the center. If we were to picture the situation, we would have a circle with God in the center, a theocentric conception, and the finite individual self somewhere inside the circle related to the center. If the finite individual is withdrawn from the circle and placed outside of it with the circle drawn around itself, the egocentric conception, this would represent the materially or mentally conceived world made of illusion or imagination. A line connecting the self and the theocentric and egocentric worlds exists. To reestablish one's true identity, one has to give up the egocentric mentality and its world and humbly attempt to re-enter the true reality of rational theocentric conception and actuality. So, Okay, oh, so one, two, three, four, five. Oh, there's five pages left. Is it okay if we continue or should we stop? However you feel, please let me know and we'll do accordingly. <laughs> we can continue for five pages. I, I'm okay with it. Okay. Let's go. Uh, reality has its own purpose in and for itself. In an article by Deepak Chopra, MD, it was mentioned that the reality we accept is a human construct. We should see ourselves as conscious creators who imbue reality with our own purposes. While many people think this way, there are also those who believe that reality is fixed and remains unaffected by our perception of it. To some extent, both are right. We do have the freedom to interpret what we experience, and the mind does play a role in determining what the senses observe. At the same time, reality doesn't just disappear when we do not perceive it. Our house is still there when we go to work for several hours. We assume it's permanence, but it could burn down when we are not there. So it is not all a human construct. And as for purposes, they also are not solely created by us. A more satisfactory conception would be one that includes and harmonizes both the idealism of a mind or consciousness-based creation of reality and the realism of the inherent purposefulness of an already existing reality of which we are part and parcel. The reality people experience is a human construct insofar as it is limited to the sensuous perception of the phenomenal world of appearance, as well as the circumscribed judgments of the finite understanding. However, this does not reach the noumenal reality in and for itself beyond or behind its apparent or phenomenal surface. In India, the Mayavad philosophy of Brahman Satyam Jagadmitya claims that reality is purely a product of human misconception and only Brahman as mere impersonal consciousness, an oxymoron since consciousness is the essence of personality, is the absolute reality or truth. This philosophy is also called Kevaladvaita. However, does not provide an alternative to material reductionism, but merely an alternative reductionism. Instead of reducing everything to matter, it proposes to reduce everything to impersonal consciousness. 
In fact, what is needed is an alternative way of thinking that is not based solely on the judgments of a finite ego that is found, for instance, in the abstract thinking of Kantian philosophy in the West, as well as in the Kevaladvaita interpretations of Sri Shankaracharya in the East. If we consider that reality already, already and always exists by and for itself, then reality or its purposes does not have to be created by humans. Rather, humans are one of the many products or creations of a reality that exists for itself, i.e. as self-conscious being for itself or having its own purposes. Because we are part and parcel of a self-conscious reality, we are also conscious. Because reality is also by itself or in itself, it is substance. Thus reality is or exists as self-conscious substance. And therefore finite instances of it are conscious substances or thinking beings. Yet these instances are not all at the same level of consciousness, but fall within a spectrum of consciousness manifested as different forms of life. This is because self-conscious reality is not abstractly or one-sidedly monistic or pure oneness, but is itself differentiated within itself, having many qualities or what is called personality. Personality is self-conscious, that is a oneness or an individual that also contains varieties or differences within it. Most people born in India within the Hindu tradition have heard of Sanatana Dharma. It means there is already an eternal purpose or order in reality that is neither created nor destroyed at any time. According to Bhagavad Gita 2.16, whatever is created is temporal, only a fleeting reality like a dream. Thus the purposes humans create are just dreams while the eternal purpose or Sanatana Dharma is the universal order or purpose valid for all creation and creatures regardless of their individual purposes. The Bhagavad Gita explains that living solely according to the self-created purposes and not in accord with Sanatana Dharma is called maya or illusion. It may be more difficult for atheists to comprehend that reality uh, having its own order, purpose, or being for itself because reality for them may be understood merely as something impersonal and indifferent. Yet, if the ultimate or absolute reality is a sentient substance, thinking being, it must have will or purpose. That is not the same as the impersonal, reified laws that scientific discovery seeks as the universal or intelligible, intelligible laws of nature. However, what we may call divine or infinite reason that belongs to reality is not the same as the finite reason that the human products or instances of reality may create for themselves. The latter are living like bubbles, with themselves as the center on the ocean of reality or truth. This is the uh, nature of Maya. However, we are not apart from reality, but an implicit part of it. A very different attitude toward reality is required to understand that difference. The consequence of the conception that we create our own reality is already producing its results all over the world. When the bubbles of individuals or groups collide with each other, the result is jealousy, war, hypocrisy, and strife. This is what uh, philosopher Thomas Hobbes called the war of all against all. El bellum omnium contra omnis. This ego, this egoist conception is based on the unlimited, is based on the limited idea of the being of reality for one's own finite consciousness that misses the universal being for self of reality, for its own self, which is infinite or the same for everyone and everything. Thus, even if we accept the principle that we create our own reality according to whatever makes us happy, the idea of individually centered realities leads to destructive consequences in the real world. The Bhaktivedanta alternative uh, for each to create or understand an unselfishly theocentric reality with its own purpose that can harmonize the freedom of each individual to produce a harmonizing reality in which all may live peacefully. In other words, creating your own reality doesn't have to be selfishly oriented, which leads to an ultimately false or illusory happiness, but theocentric, which leads to humility, love, and a peaceful, harmonious life. In order to regain their connection with reality, one must burst their own bubble of self-centered reality 
and surrender to their eternal constitutional purpose or Sanatan Dharma, which is not to be identified with any political, social, or other partisan religious groups. Rather, it is that purpose which belongs to all such groups, individuals, and even inanimate instances of reality within the cosmic and transcosmic order. You may rightly inquire what the universal purpose is that the individual must dovetail the universal. Uh, you, you may rightly inquire what the universal purpose is that the individual must dovetail with the universal will. Science, when properly conceived, is an attempt to discover the order or laws that implicitly govern nature. However, instead of deriving those laws from the observations of nature, modern science has retreated from nature into their own theories, ideologies, and models of nature. Thus, rather than concluding from the natural observation that life comes only from life, they create an ideological scenario in which they have now forced themselves to think that life comes from matter. This completely opposes what is observed in nature. A rational study of nature is not the only way to understand the universal will. Those, rise, uh, those wise and saintly souls who have plumed the depths of reality also have something to say about these things. We can learn from them if we have the intelligence to understand their contribution to knowledge, which concerns the most profound spiritual nature of man beyond the immediate surface of appearing nature. Those great saints and sages, spiritual scientists, have recorded their discoveries in revered books called scriptures or revealed knowledge. Their understanding of true reality, uh, their understanding of true knowledge or knowledge of the truth, is that it is always self-revealing, being the inherent constitutional nature of one's own true self in the cosmos. As Krishna, the name of the self-revealing reality, explains at the end of Bhagavad Gita 18.66, all individually motivated dharma or purpose must be renounced, sarva dharmam prityaga, and one must surrender, sharanam, to him, the self-conscious reality that the various religions call God. This surrender entails submitting one's individual will to serve the interest or purpose of the universal will, under whose direction the entire cosmos moves and derives its existence and purpose. Opposed as this may seem to the modern idea of scientific thinking, this can be demonstrated to be a completely scientific and rational conception from all points of view that we attempt to present. Although it is a revolutionary way of thinking, surrendering to the universal will provides a rational alternative that can be justified only after careful study and application of the Bhaktivedanta philosophy. Okay. Yes, Didi. Um, I think I think it is will and the purpose of the universe. What was the question? What is the will and the purpose of the universe? What is the will and purpose of the universe? Yes, what Maharaj was saying is that these the will and the purpose of the universe, that is what is um, the infinite. Not the universe, but the universal. Not the universe in the sense of there are many galaxies inside a universe like that, but universal uh, is in reference to these three aspects of every concept, right? Every concept has an individual, a particular, and a universal aspect. So universal is the most broad under which particular kinds of things and then individual instances of those kinds of things are manifest. Right? There are many individual uh, life forms, let's say. Right? There are many individual people, many individual animals, but those are, part, those are under a category of particularity of living things. Right? The human beings are differentiated as mammals uh, along with cows and horses. And then you have plants that are differentiated different flowers and trees. These are two different types of being, living beings, individual living beings, trees and flowers or uh, humans and cows. Those are two different categories. But then if you take another level above, they belong to living things. It's, it's, a, it's a different category. It's the particular, right? 
So the universal then is what all the categories belong to. What is the most indeterminate uh, general category that all these things that are different from each other, but they all belong to this one unifying category. That's what the universal is. So the universal what Maharaj is referring to is, is Krishna. Right? Krishna means the all attractive in Sanskrit. The, the word, the name Krishna translates to all attractive. So the concept of God, the concept of the absolute, of the infinite, like we were saying before. The infinite is the context in which all finite things derive everything in their experience, their sense of purpose, their sense of will. So what Maharaj was saying is it's possible to then uh, direct, remember that little diagram we've had with the circle and the dot in the middle, and then the line where that same dot was then on the outskirts of the other circle with a different dot in the middle. One was called theocentric, one was called egocentric. So, so dovetailing the universal will means to then, like we said before, recognize that the egocentric will only results in illusion. Hearing what the scriptures have said, hearing what the saints have said, taking the path of reason, and, and, and like we said before, not just speculating our own things, but trying to uh, tap into that process of reason, which is permeating ourself and nature. Right? This is another method, the method of philosophy. But these things are all leading to the movement, the dynamic activity, the self-revealing dynamic activity of the universal, that which under everything else is coming. And that's, so that is the will of God. And what is the will of God? Well, in Bhakti, we're, we're uh, told that the, uh, in Bhagavad Gita, we're told, right, um, Acharya among Vijaniya, right? We have to establish a personal relationship with Guru. Right? This is how we can come into contact with that personal will. It's a personal thing. Uh, right? and, and Bhakti, where this is the highest development of, of, this, of, the, of reason. Reason is always meaning of consciousness. Consciousness is always referring to the conscious person. The infinite person means God. We're an individual person having finite will, self-centered, the whole idea is to redirect that to the will of the infinite person. But sometimes I think we have problems because we have so many prior ideas of, we have so many prior ideas of, you know, your question was what is the, the, the will of the universe? And it sounded like I, can we I think sometimes that the will of the universe is different. I mean, what were you going to say, Didi? I'm sorry. Yeah. If I understand, like, uh, what is the will of the universe? If I just relate it to Krishna, it would become what's the will of Krishna and purpose of Krishna. So it is automatically the will of the Krishna and the purpose of the Krishna is stated in the Bhagavad Gita. Just now you read down. Sarvadharma Parityajan Mamekam Sharanam Vrata. So that is his will. We are supposed to let go of the dharma and surrender to him. That is his will, and that is what is his purpose of telling all this. That is what I can relate. But when you said, uh, is that the one uh, Maharaj has in mind when he says will and the purpose? That's what I am. What is the will and the purpose of the universe? Is it what I am thinking about? It? Right, so again, it's, we're trying to emphasize it's universal. It's not the physical, we're not saying the physical universe. He's saying universal, which means the broadest. What is the broadest? And that will, yes, in the conclusion of the Vedic wisdom is that it is the will of God. Um, so now, I mean, that, that's a pretty straightforward response in the way that we come to know that is through the process of bhakti, right? In, in Vaishnavism. The only reason I'm hesitating is because we're not just dogmatically saying that this book, the purpose of this book is not just to uh, blindly accept that conclusion. 
the purpose mm -hmm. of this book is to present the philosophical development of ideas that gets people to think in terms of purpose in nature, right? Many people may not be on the platform of, okay, uh, let's just accept the conclusion of, uh, we're talking about the scientists now, of course. I think the people who are here listening are already engaged in practicing uh, bhakti yoga, which is very nice. And we're, we're coming here together to try to continue that practice and, and go deeper into that practice in bhakti. But this book is also aimed at a scientific audience who's nowhere near that place, right? So, so now it's speaking to that. Speaking to that, there is inherent purpose in nature. And that is the reason that we're able to come to know things about nature. We can see we, we're in that purpose. We can come to determine that purpose. We see that organisms are trying to survive, that they're perpetuating themselves, right? The, these are all things which distinguish life from non-life. And just, just taking that observation itself that there is purpose there is goal directed activity in nature just that principle and then the philosophical development of that which has been given by Kant and Hegel and in a deeper way how we can come to know these things and see in that way that will benefit us even if we're not on the platform of wanting to take up a religious life taking a philosophical approach to understanding the thought determinations which influence our perception of nature, that will bring us uh, a more comprehensive idea of nature itself. So this is one of the other elements of the book, which is what's trying to be presented. And of course, the development of Hegel himself is also that, you know, it, it is, the absolute is God, is substance, the substance of, of reality is as much subject as it is substance. Subject means person, personality. And Hegel shows that through the development of his philosophy. So it's not just a blind faith, it's a development of reason itself, but, it, but seeing that reason in, our, in the thought determinations which underlie our thinking and then seeing that reason in nature, that's all the precursor and Hegel develops that. And it's not until later in that development that you see it as absolute personality by and for itself. And then the further development of that is given in the Vedic wisdom, right? What were the activities of Krishna when he had his manifest pastimes here in this world? What are the instructions given at the end? What is the conclusion of that? As you said, Devahuti Didi give up all kinds of duty and just surrender unto me. And Maharaj was mentioning yesterday in Sangha and, and last Saturday that even that instruction itself uh, by the devotees of Sri Krishna Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, that instruction itself is seen to be something external because it includes renunciation to some degree. It says, Tiaga, Sarva Dharmam Prit Tiaga, and saying, give up the duties and then surrender unto me. So when Ramananda Roy is talking to Mahaprabhu and Mahaprabhu is inquiring from Ramananda Roy and he wants to hear something profound from Ram Ramananda Roy because he knows he's a pure devotee. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu knows Ramananda Roy is a pure devotee. When Ramananda Roy quotes that verse from Bhagavad Gita, which many people you know, accept as the culmination of Bhagavad Gita, that is the, the deepest, the most conclusive instruction given by Krishna in the Gita, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu says, oh, that's still external because the element of chag is there. And that in the devotion that Mahaprabhu himself expressed through his own activities that he showed, right? Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is the Acharya Lila of Krishna, showing through his own activities what the souls of this Kali Yuga need to do in order to uh, harmonize with that universal will. What are the activities that the soul needs to do in this Kali Yuga? 
Krishna came as Chaitanya Mahaprabhu to show that himself through those activities. And Chaitanya Mahaprabhu accepted Guru, Ishvara Puri, right? He accepted Guru. He was doing service to the devotees. He was doing this Harinam Sankirtan. So the development of Vedic wisdom goes in that direction. The way to harmonize with the universal will, universal purpose, is to have faith in the word of God through the scripture, which leads to the acceptance of the position of the bona fide spiritual master, Acharya among Vijanya, following the example of Mahaprabhu, taking guru, accepting, accepting the role of guru in our life, taking those instructions very seriously, and then making the will of guru our own will. We tr very carefully trying to surrender to guru, coming to know the desires of guru, and then all of our actions, all of our thoughts, trying to uh, be absorbed in serving that. And again, the bona fide guru means their will, their desires are the will and desire of their of their guru. And the will and desire of their guru is the will and desire of their guru. And that disciplic succession, again, is con connected to Krishna, right? This is also given the parampara succession. So through that process of surrender, that is the practical method through accepting uh, the direction of guru, through hearing uh, what guru is really presenting and, and trying to come to know the desires and the will of guru. And then using all of our, as much as possible, our time and energy for that, all of our thoughts, all of our activities, as much as possible, becoming absorbed in that. That is the most direct, practical, substantial way to harmonize our daily activity with the universal will and purpose. That's, that is the conclusion of Vedic knowledge as given by the Vaishnavas. So that's why we're here today, trying to do that. So I pay my most sincere, humble obeisances to all of you here today. Jai Shumati Devahuti Devi Dasi Ki Jai, Jai Shumati Uma Devi Dasi Ki Jai, Jai Dr. Suhu Ki Jai, Jai Bhakti Ki Jai, Dhamma Bhakti Veda Ring the Ki Jai, Jai Shrila, Jai Shri Pad Bhakti Madhavapuri Maharaj Ki Jai, Jai Shri Pad Bhakti Maharaj Ki Jai, Jai Shri Pad 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 Maharaj Ki Jai, Jai